And so, I mean, first of all, maybe you can lay out for people who don't know your work, you know, what is the basic argument that you're proposing in terms of intelligent design? It's different from the young earth creationist uh, approach. It, it, it's a, it, it tends to take the question, question the, of evolution and of those types of proofs seriously, but then see them in a, in a different frame. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a great place to start. Um, quick definition: the theory of intelligent design uh, affirms that that uh, life and the universe are best explained by a designing intelligence rather than by undirected material processes, such as in the biological realm, natural selection acting on random variation. So, uh, and it's it's quite different from. Uh, young Earth creationism in that it is making no claims about the age of the Earth. Most proponents of intelligent design think, as I do, that the Earth is very old. Uh, and But it's, it's an age-neutral proposition. It's saying that life is designed as opposed to merely giving the appearance of design, which is what many Darwinian biologists say. In fact, that is classic Darwinianism. Uh, Richard Dawkins has said that biology is a study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a, a purpose. But the, the, the claim that the, the Darwinists make is that, that the uh, appearance is an illusion. That uh, And it, it's an illusion because even though life looks as though it was designed, the, the appearance of design is a product of an unguided, undirected mechanism namely natural selection and uh, acting on random variation. So our, our, our challenge to the evolutionary establishment is not about the idea of change over time or about the idea of microevolution or adaptation. It's not even necessarily about the idea of universal common descent, the idea that all organisms are related by common ancestry. Although I personally and other ID proponents are skeptical about that, others are not. But what we're really challenging is this idea that there's no evidence of actual design in life. The, the claim that life is the product of undirected processes such that the appearance of design is just an appearance, just an illusion. So our, our, we, we tie, uh, named our theory intelligent design to contrast it with that idea of Darwinian apparent design. Hmm. Uh, now, so back to, to creationism, creationism and intelligent design are different in two ways. One, creationism is committed to a particular age of the earth and a particular reading of the days of Genesis uh, in, the, in the Bible. Uh, our theory is neutral about that, but most of us as scientists hold that the earth is very old. Uh, and secondly, the creationism is derivative from, or as is in a sense, a kind of a deduction or interpretation of a bit of the biblical text, whereas the theory of intelligent design is an inference from biological and astronomical and physical and cosmological data. It's a, it starts with the, the, the evidence and infers to the activity of a designing mind behind the evidence as a matter of scientific and philosophical reasoning. Mm -hmm. And so my understanding is also that one of the, the biggest arguments you have is that in some ways, the level of complexity that the world is actually uh, made of was not available to Darwin at the time. He didn't understand just how many levels of complexity existed even within the cell and within you know DNA and, and the constituents of, of life. And every level that you add acts and adds an exponential level of, of uh, randomness or, or of possibility. And therefore, it's just the possibility of like the capacity for something to be simply the things, you know, bumping into each other over millions of years is just mathematically impossible. Well, yeah, there's a lot, you've said a lot there that's all very relevant. Um, the, if we move from our definition that, uh, uh, of the theory of intelligent design, that intelligent design uh, uh, affirms that there are certain features of life and the universe that are best explained by a designing mind or intelligence rather than undirected processes. Uh, that leads naturally to the question, well, what kinds of features are you talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, and in the realm of physics, one of those features is something that many physicists talk about today, and that is the, the evidence that the universe was in some way fine-tuned to allow for the possibility of life. We have the, the basic parameters of physics, the, the, the laws of physics, the constants of physics, the initial conditions of the universe. All of these things have been discovered to fall within very narrow ranges or tolerances outside of which life and even basic chemistry would be impossible. And so there's this high degree of fine tuning, this in, in, incredibly improbable degree of fine tuning that has led many physicists, even physicists like Sir Fred Hoyle, who was a very prominent scientific atheist early in his career, to reverse field. 
Mm -hmm. Oil discovered some of these fine tuning parameters and then uh, later realized there must be a fine tuner behind the fine tuning. And he was quoted as saying that uh, a common sense interpretation of the data suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics to make life possible. So that's one of those classes of evidence, the, the, uh, the evidence of fine tuning that we find in physics and cosmology. Uh, but within the biological realm, you're right, this, the discovery of the extraordinary complexity of even what we used to think of as the simple cell has led more and more biologists to doubt theories about the, first of all, the chemical evolutionary origin of life, the idea that you could have a series of chemical reactions over a long period of time and move from chemicals in some sort of prebiotic soup to the first living cell. And it has also led many scientists to doubt the, the, the full-on biological evolutionary theory, the Darwinian part of the story that you can get from the first cell to all the new forms of life, again, through an undirected, unguided process, such as natural selection and acting on random variation. Hmm. So what types of complexity are we seeing inside life? Hmm. The, the most extraordinary discoveries started in the, in the 1950s and 60s. And these were the, dis the discoveries of the information bearing properties of the large, what are called biomacromolecules, things like DNA, RNA, and proteins. Um, Watson and Crick elucidate the structure of DNA in 1953. It's a pretty big discovery, very big breakthrough. But in 1958, uh, Francis Crick, working on his own, it's interesting, he'd been a code breaker in World War II, He's working on his own and he realizes that along the spine of the DNA molecule, on the interior of that famed double helix, there are a series of chemical subunits. And he realizes that those chemical subunits, they're called bases or nucleotide bases, are functioning like alphabetic characters in a written language or like digital characters, like the zeros and ones in a, in a section of machine code. And he's making these discoveries about the same time that you're having the information revolution taking place in engineering and math and physics. And so you have the, the concepts of information coming into the sciences. And George Gamow, a very famous physicist, realizes that Crick's description of the, the DNA molecule can be rendered that what he's describing with the, the, the function of the, the nucleotide bases he says that a series of those bases can be rendered as a digital bit string. This is a, mm -hmm. a string of information for directing, and this was Crick's hypothesis, for directing the construction of proteins and protein machines that keep cells alive. So by the mid-1960s, when this sequence hypothesis of, Watts, uh, of Francis Crick is confirmed, you, biology enters an information age, and people realize that inside the cell, we don't just have chemical reactions going on. It's not just metabolism, even. Mm -hmm. It's, it's an information storage, transmission, and processing system. Yeah. And if there's two different processing systems inside the cell, one for replicating DNA and one for using the information in DNA to direct the construction of proteins. And so the, the sophistication of the informational system that's at work inside even the simplest cell, even one cell bacteria have information processing and storage capacity of the type I'm describing, this, this completely changes the terms of debate about the origin of life and even, even uh, evolutionary biology, because we now realize that in order to build uh, the first living cell and in order to build new life from pre-existing life, in each case, you have to have information. Just as in our computer world, you need code to produce, uh, to, to, if you want to give your computer a new function, if you want to have a new app or a new program mm -hmm. or a new operating system, you've got to provide information. Same thing turns out to be true in life. If you want to build a new form of life from a simpler pre-existing form, or if you want to build life in the first place, You've got to have information to build the proteins and the molecular machines and the other structures inside the cell. And so that's that creates a shift. It, it puts ev all evolutionary theories under pressure. Uh, I would say that, that both chemical and biological evolutionary theory have reached a state of impasse because they cannot explain the origin of information. And yet we know from experience that information always arises from a known source, and that source is intelligence.